uh, another source of conflict in the world, uh, sometimes, as we've mentioned, uh, drawn along racial or ethnic lines, is poverty. Uh, what, what are the true causes of poverty as you have been able to, to discern them in your study of the world in a, in a comparative way? I'm afraid that I haven't even looked for the causes of poverty. I, I regard poverty as just simply the absence of wealth. So what I look for are the things that cause wealth to occur. I don't believe that there's any particular reason why everyone in the world would in fact have the same wealth. Uh, there are certain peculiar circumstances that have arisen in a few countries on the face of the earth and only relatively recently in human history that has made the kind of affluence that exists in the United States or Western Europe or Japan uh, commonplace in these countries. So what I'm interested in is what peculiar set of circumstances have caused that to come about. Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that people ought to be asking that question and not the question of poverty. Everyone is born poor and ignorant. To the extent that people become different, we have to find out what are the things that enable them to become different and how can those opportunities be more widely generalized. Well, you have written that in order to be a partisan of the poor, you must at first uh, be a partisan of the truth. What then do you think gets close to being at the truth of, of the sources of wealth generation? What, what creates wealth? Oh, skills, uh, traits of human beings of one sort or another, um, discipline, organization, uh, entrepreneurship. Again, there's not the slightest reason to expect these various factors, and there are many, many others, obviously, are ever going to be randomly distributed. Every single group has its own history. It has its own uh, geographic setting in which it developed and so on. It would be an absolute miracle if all these factors were the same uh, across groups. And nowhere in the world do we find them even approximately the same. Uh, the difference in income between blacks and whites in the United States, for example, is very commonplace around the world. It's about the same as the difference between uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazic Jews in Israel. Uh, it's smaller than the difference between Chinese and Malays in Malaysia. It's much smaller than the difference between East Indians in Africa in East Africa. Uh, and you could go on and on down through history and around, around the world. Nowhere do I find this even distribution of income or the even distribution of people in occupations or in institutions that people talk about as sort of a norm that would exist if there were no institutional discrimination. Well, you, you seem to trace uh, wealth generation uh, or the absence of it, namely poverty, to a kind of human capital that uh, groups uh, carry around with them. Mm -hmm. I, is this human capital uh, inherited or is it, uh, is, it, is it acquired? Oh, acquired, because uh, at different periods of history, you'll find one racial group centuries ahead of another, and then a thousand years later, it'll be the other way around. The Jews and the Egyptians would be a classic example that the Jews were held as slaves in the times of the pharaohs. Clearly today, Israel is far more advanced than, uh, than Egypt. Uh, you can find many other kinds of uh, reversals of that sort if you look in history. Uh, just within the European community, uh, Britain was very easily conquered by a relatively small force of Romans in the days of the Roman Empire. Uh, clearly, uh, England has been ahead of Italy now for, uh, for centuries by a vast amount. Well, what seems to be uh, critical in the, uh, in the equation, in the human capital equation and in the acquisition of, of human capital? Is uh, it education? Sometimes education can make a contribution. I think that's greatly overrated in most cases, and particularly as it relates to underdeveloped countries and to some extent to groups that are just emerging from poverty in a given country. That is, if you have merely formal education, what you may create is an expectation of an enormous economic advantage, of an enormous uh, entitlement to power and privilege and so on, which can be negative in its impact in the sense that there are people in pl places like India or Indonesia, Malaysia, who have acquired a certain low level of education. But because that education is so rare in their country, they will no longer accept many kinds of jobs that require them to work with their hands. And that would include even engineers, you see, who want to sit behind the desk and look at the blueprints, but don't want to stand out there in, in the hip boots and the muck, uh, supervising the construction of the building. So that when you have those kinds of attitudes and you're simply creating a sense of entitlement without a corresponding set of skills to uh, generate the wealth, to pay it off, uh, then that may be a negative factor in the country's growth. Well, you link wealth creation to uh, the acquisition of skills and the employment of skills in a, in a disciplined way and also uh, in, a, uh, in a frugal way in, in terms of, of, of lifestyles. Yeah. But others would, would attribute uh, the generation of poverty, the obverse of wealth, 
to uh, colonialism, imperialism, exploitation, uh, yes. uh, economic exploitation. How, how do you handle handle those arguments? Well, insofar as those arguments are meant seriously, you can simply look at evidence. Uh, insofar as they're purely political arguments, they're saying what people want to hear. Obviously, there are people who would much rather hear that than to hear the other, because if you think that's the problem, then it's not, there's not only a, a quicker solution, uh, but there's a more, m more emotionally and morally satisfying solution, uh, namely you fight against the exploiters and so on. If you look at the third world, for example, those parts of the third world where the uh, imperialist powers have come in, have typically been the more advanced parts of it. They've been the most post prosperous ones. Even if they weren't prosperous before they got there, they became the more prosperous parts. Those parts of the third world that the imperialists have never touched are, almost without exception, the very poorest places on this earth. So you don't find any, exploit, uh, any explanation for poverty and colonialism? Uh, the reverse, perhaps? Oh, absolutely. That when, when the Romans, for example, invaded uh, the British Isles, they conquered uh, the southern part of uh, Britain, but they never conquered Scotland. Uh, and for centuries thereafter, perhaps for a thousand years thereafter, Scotland was far behind England in economic and cultural development because England had the advantage of tying into the whole Roman civilization and everything that it had created to some extent percolated down through the British. Uh, that doesn't mean the British were happy with the Romans being there. You know, a thousand years later, Churchill could say, we owe London to Rome, but that's a thousand years later, and Churchill didn't have to go through what those people went through. So I'm not saying this is good for the people who were there, but in the, but in the longer run, of course, England became what it was because the Romans came, and Scotland re finally developed only after England conquered Scotland, and then the culture that developed in England then could spread into, into Scotland as well. Well, does this suggest then that in addressing poverty in today's world there ought to be a latter-day reincarnation of imperialism or colonialism in some form? No, uh, because I think politically it's impossible. Uh, they're, they're, I, I hear from, the, from various parts of uh, some independent nations, they say that they, they, they were better off under colonialism and so on. That, is, that isn't in the cards. Uh, the, the people who are in the imperialist nations don't want to take on that But some cost. would say that there is the functional equivalent of that in the operation of the multinational corporation today. Do you see that, uh, the operation of the multinational corporation, as help or hindrance to uh, the generation of wealth in developing countries? Well, in those countries, the multinational corporations uh, very often uh, not only pay more money than the local industry pays, but it brings in skills that don't exist and creates industries that, that, that never were there before. To that extent, I think they, they are a source of the transmission of international uh, human capital. Uh, to that extent, yes.